Good morning, Gateway family. A very, very warm welcome to you all. And also welcome to any visiting viewers that we may have this morning. So there are five more online services and I am so glad they are coming to an end. On the 6th of September, we are meeting back at the Goodless House facility. So please diarize that date, 1030 Sunday, the 6th of September, we are going back to normal face-to-face -face services. Well, they may not be quite so normal, but nonetheless, we'll be together. And nearer the time, we'll send out some guidelines that we'll just ask that you all observe, just so that all of us are safe during this COVID crisis. Then two more announcements. We promised that during the month of August, we'd be planning some social events. So every Sunday, after our online services, we'll be meeting at different locations. Obviously, we'll be observing social distancing. But today, we are meeting at the Otters Pool Promenade by the Red Bull at 1 p.m. Obviously, if it's bucketing down with rain, that will not be happening. But if not, please pack your picnic lunch, your picnic blanket, perhaps a pair of walking shoes. And hopefully, for those who can make it, we'll see you at one today. Finally, June 2021, next year that is, we have our Gateway Family Camp. We'll sh flat a short video now that you'll just see a few details, but look out for the booking form that will come out in September. And so more details will follow about that weekend away. But in the meantime, please block out the last weekend of June 2021. Thank you again for joining us and many thanks to Simon and Andrew who have put the next two worship songs together. God bless you all and enjoy the rest of the service. We'll see you soon.
the setting sun His love is yours forever By the grace of God we will carry on His love is yours forever Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Sing praise Forever God is faithful Forever God is strong Forever God is with us
could not hold you The veil told it for you You silenced the boast of sin and grace The heavens are roaring The praise of your glory For you are raised to life again verses 1 to 18 in the ESV version. The Resurrection. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloth lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloth lying there, and the face cloth which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloth but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Jesus appears to Mary Magdalene. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, and as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, 
Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. What an incredible passage of scripture. Thank you, Amy Lee. Friends, my Redeemer lives. I know he lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living because, just because, he lives. Can we pray? Father, I want to thank you for that hope we have in you this morning. That uh, the grave is denied. Death has been broken. The power of death has been broken. And you are victorious. You are glorious. You are the resurrected Lord and King. And uh, we have that life, that resurrection life and resurrection hope in you this morning. And I want to thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So friends, we're going to be uh, looking at John chapter 20 and break it up into two parts actually. The second reading will come about halfway through the message. Jesus proclaimed, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. That's quite some claim. And uh, it's a powerful gospel declaration that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was raised up. Uh, to laugh again and that was um, on the third day so it's pivotal it's pivotal to our faith and Paul says to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians uh, I think it's chapter 15 if Christ has not been raised your faith is futile and you are still in your sins so it's that key and this year friends the world's sheltering from uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, this virus that seems to be invisible threat. Uh, and it's a storm that's come upon the world. And you see, God sheltered Jesus in the tomb for three days. And on the third day, Jesus came forth in power to bring salvation to the whole world. So what's God going to do in and through his people coming out of this COVID storm? Out of this sheltering time or lockdown. You see, the tomb is famous because of what it does not contain. It does not contain death. And God's people don't contain death. We are resurrection life carriers. Death swallowed up in victory. Don't you love that? You see, the power of the resurrection or resurrection power of Jesus broke Satan's captive power. The hold of death. Death, where is your sting? Where is your hold? And uh, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Romans 6, 4 verse, chapter 6 verse 4 tells us. You see, resurrection power and resurrection life. On, on the university campus that I attended, there was a Christian group called Res Life. And I loved that. What a great name. And uh, I kind of think, well, for young people, yeah, it's a great name. But what about senior saints or senior citizens? You know, if you had a Christian uh, group that was in a care home or something, why not call it Res Life or Third Day or something? Something like that. And he has the promise in Romans chapter 8, verse 11. And it declares the following. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Because of the spirit who lives in you. Wow. John's gospel is a remarkable gospel. It reflects uh, unique insights of the man who was so close and so intimate to Jesus while on earth. And when he wrote this gospel, he wants to read it not just to know what Jesus did, but to embrace who Jesus was and, and is. 
He wants believers to be absolutely sure that the eyewitnesses uh, and Jesus' own words and his astonishing works all point to the one who is truly God. Come in the flesh, the living word, the very glory of God among men. Ah, wow. <laughs> John's collective evidence and proof all make the most compelling testimony to Jesus' right to demand our ongoing trust and our obedience. And uh, Isaac Watts so powerfully penned this in a hymn. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all, my all, my everything. And so we come to this chapter 20, which covers the aftermath of Jesus' crucifixion, his burial, uh, the empty tomb, the risen Jesus encounter with Mary Magdalene, um, and then Jesus appearing to his disciples and their commissioning to go forth from there. So this chapter begins with, uh, by, begins by describing the scene of the resurrection. And Jesus is appearing to Mary Magdalene. Magdalene. The body of Jesus was wrapped in linen cloth and 75 pounds, I think it's about 34 kilograms, of expensive spices. You see, if anyone had removed the body, a grave robber, or they would have, they would have taken the lot. No thief would have left anything of value behind. Uh, those were the only items of value. Yet the linen cloths were found lying there and the face cloth that had covered Jesus' head was neatly folded um, just away from the other garments or the other linen cloth. And so this is a detailed and it's a vivid description and, and it dismantles uh, a notion of a carefully concocted invention of imagination. And also stating the fact that when the disciples saw, they believed. For as yet they did not understand the scriptures. That indicates that the disciples did not fabricate a, a carefully or a story to, to a preconceived notion of, of what was going to happen or what was predicted. Rather, they were confronted with the certain facts, the certain facts, which, with which they were initially unable to relate to Scripture. So at this stage, no one had seen the risen Lord. No one had seen Him. Yet the evidence of the state of the tomb alone, just that, and the absence of Jesus' body was enough to convince them, was enough in itself to convince them of the resurrection. And I love what Nicky Gumbel uh, says on this particular a passage. They had believed that Jesus was the Messiah before, but, but this was different. This was different. They saw and they believed. They saw that and believed that God's power and energy had raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus was alive. He was alive. And this was, this was unexpected. You see, winter had passed, uh, it was, it was sunshine breaking through. The, the spring had come. Winter was over. And then when the New Testament speaks of love, the focus is, is on the cross. And yet when the New Testament speaks of God's energy and power, the focus is on what? The resurrection. For example, and I'm going to read from the Message Translation, uh, chapter 1 of Ephesians and verse 19 to 23. Oh! The utter extravagance of his work in us who trust him. Endless energy, boundless strength. All this energy issues from Christ. God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven. In charge of running the universe. Everything from galaxies to governments. No name and no power exempt from his rule. And not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all and has the final word on everything. As I've often said, he's large and he's in charge. And at the center of this, 
Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. It's not at the outskirts of the world, marginalized. No, the church is Christ's body, which he speaks and acts, and which he speaks and acts, by which he fills everything with his presence. Wow! <laughs> or as someone said, wowzers. <laughs> For those in Christ, the same power and energy that raised him, raised Jesus Christ from the dead, lives in you. Now lives in you. That's, that's good news. That's great news. Can you imagine John having taken Jesus, his mother, Mary, into his home, opening the door and saying, guess what? And I'm sure Mary is like, What? The tomb's empty. Jesus has been raised from the dead. Jesus is alive. And as incredulous as it must have sounded, it was true. It was true then and it's true now. Jesus is alive today. That's, that's tremendous news. Not only to, to receive, but to bring and share. John records four resurrection appearances and three of these are in this particular chapter, chapter 20. And he describes not only uh, some of the evidence, but also the results of the resurrection. And the first, awe and amazement. In what reads as a first-hand account of Jesus' appearance to Mary Magdalene. It's like her head spinning. It's like she doesn't know where to turn. She stoops to look in the tomb. And you can almost visualize that at that moment. Speaks to the angel sitting there. Turns around to see uh, or look outside. And mistakes Jesus for the gardener. And then she turns back into the tomb. And turns again to speak to Jesus. And as she realizes to, in her awe and amazement that uh, it's Jesus. She's, she's proclaiming. She cries out, Rabboni, Rabboni, teacher. And embraces him. And he explains to her that she must not touch him or try to hold on to him. She must being, must being, begin a new, more internal relationship with the risen Jesus. He in her and she in him. Something would be fulfilled with the gift of the Holy Spirit. Wow. And when Jesus in gentleness and great respect commissions her to go and tell others that's radical that's radical he's not choosing uh, a triumphant appearance to signify his victory over death no in the culture of the day a woman's testimony would not have been considered uh, admissible in a court or uh, as as weighty as that of, of a man she the loved one the forgiven one the delivered one, uh, the one who had demons driven out of her, she gets to share the greatest news of all time, the gospel, the good news, and she gets to share it first. That's not something that disciples would have made up. Friends, it's not enough to know the evidence if the facts of the resurrection. We need a personal encounter with the resurrected Jesus. And then secondly, along with awe and amazement, joy and peace follow. The world is desperately searching for, for lasting happiness and peace of mind. They're supremely found in a relationship with Jesus. With Jesus. Mary rushes off to tell the disciples, I've seen the Lord. I've seen the Lord. Let's continue the account by having the second reading for this morning. Good morning. I'm going to be reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. On the evening of the day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, 
peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withheld forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We've seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see his hands, the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen, yet have believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Amen. Thank you so much, Sue, for that second part of the reading today. So we see Jesus' appearance to his disciples. It brings them overwhelming joy and peace. Three times in this passage, Jesus says, peace to you, peace be with you. And that's a peace that the world doesn't give and the world cannot take. An inner peace that flows from being in his presence. And our faith in, in Jesus brings joy and peace to, to all who believe. And the transformation of this group of frightened, confused individuals into a community of love, of joy and of peace is, is in this short encounter is, is remarkable. And thirdly, along with awe and amazement and joy and peace, there's purpose and there's power that follows and follows. Jesus gives them a new sense of purpose. As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. And uh, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead is a message of hope for the world. There's life beyond the grave. And I'm reminded of Keith Green singing uh, what was best known as the Easter song. And uh, hear the bells ringing. They're singing that you can be born again. Hear the bells ringing. They're singing Christ is risen from the dead. The angel up on the tombstone said, he has risen just as he said. Quickly now go tell his disciples that Jesus Christ is no longer dead. Joy to the world. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. Hallelujah. He is risen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's worth listening to. You see, songs seem to carry truth so well. And in the bridge of the song, what a beautiful name that we sang this morning. Uh, death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin in the grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory, for you are raised to life again. Jesus, alive. And because he's alive, there's hope, there's life in him. And he promised us, out of us will flow rivers of living water. A life that is to be carried, to be shared. There's a river of life flowing out of me, makes the lame to walk, makes the blind to see, opens prison doors, sets the captives free. There's a river of life flowing out of me. All my Sunday school children's songs that uh, I remember. There's a fountain flowing from the Savior's side. All my sins forgiven in that precious tide. Jesus paid the price when for me he died, there's a fountain flowing from the Savior's side. And then I love this next verse. There's a risen Savior 
at the Father's throne, ever interceding for his own, pouring down the blessings that are his alone. There's a risen Savior at the Father's side. That gives life on earth a whole new meaning, a whole new purpose. We are we are the sent ones. He came to seek and save the lost so that we could too go on the same mission statement to seek and save the lost. And uh, we sent by Jesus to proclaim this good news message to the whole world. And what we've received, we are to pass on. And thankfully, Jesus said he's not going to leave us as orphans, that he gave us a promise of the Father, the precious Holy Spirit. And Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And if you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive their sins, they are not forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. That's verse 22 and 23 from this passage today. You see, Jesus empowered them as he empowers us. The Holy Spirit provides the strength and the authority to forgive. The same power that raised him up from the dead is available to you, to me. And he's given us the power of his spirit, the Holy Spirit, the power of his word. So both spirit and both word to declare the message of God's forgiveness to human beings, to the world. And this is a message that brings eternal life. And along with the message and the mandate, he's given us the means, the empowerment of the spirit. And then fourthly, along with joy, awe and amazement and joy and peace and purpose and power comes uh, respect and reverence. Thomas, a cynic, if there ever was one, skeptical, full of doubt, unless I see the nails in my hands, the nail marks in his hands, and put my finger where uh, his nails were, and put my hand in his side, I will not believe. That's verse 25. That's not un unlike the world today. Seeing's believing. Wow, well, where's this God? Show me your God. Imagine the shock and, the, and how Thomas must have felt so small when, when Jesus said to him, put your finger here, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Thomas, and believe. And then Jesus wonderfully just accepts Thomas just as he is, he accepts his challenge and without criticism, without uh, complaint. And when you and I mess up, and, and surely we will, you see, Jesus brings correction. But it isn't to condemn, it's to, to help, to cure. Isaiah 49, the Lord has comforted his people and will have compassion on his afflicted. Look, I've inscribed you on the palms of my hands. Isaiah 49. And so he's calling them to gaze upon his open hands. And the wounds of Jesus they reveal the Father's love. They reveal the, 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 the Savior's love. They reveal the Savior's forgiveness, the Savior's healing, and even His great humility. There's a battleground from the beginning, from the creation of, of mankind. There's doubt and unbelief. Satan, when he tempted Eve, said, God did not surely say, you'll, you'll not really die. You see, it's not a sin to doubt. Don't, don't feel guilty. But like Thomas, be honest about your doubts. Bring them to Jesus. Jesus answered them in a way such that Thomas, with, was, with great respect and reverence and awe, he responded to Jesus saying, My Lord and my God. That's the first person. Jesus is, uh, Thomas is the first person to look upon Jesus and call him God. It's the strongest statement of the divinity in all the Gospels. Thomas's statement is a clear confession of his newfound faith in, the, in Jesus as both Lord and his God. And then Jesus goes on to tell him that belief leads to blessing and indeed to life. Belief and, and life go hand in hand. Jesus is the life. Jesus is the life giver. Jesus is the one who gives abundant life, full life. He's the real deal. He's the, the genuine article. 
And uh, John's entire purpose in writing the gospel is that all readers and hearers come to confess Jesus as Lord and God in the same way that Thomas did. And in verse 31, so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in in his in 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 and that by believing you may have life in his name. The resurrection of Jesus is the basis of our hope for life before death, as well as beyond it. And I want to close with Romans 8, verse 9 to 11 in the message. It's, it's a challenge and a commission to us this morning. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than of him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed this invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But if for you who welcome him, in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on God's terms. It stands to reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bringing you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does, as surely as he does or did in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. With the spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's. Can we pray? Jesus, my Lord and my God, I worship you in awe and reverence. Thank you for your amazing love and your amazing grace that you were willing to die for me. Thank you that you overcame death and the grave and that that same resurrection power now lives in me and will give life to my body. Thank you, Jesus. Fill me with that energy today. Fill me with that life today that I may overwhelm or overflow with that life, that I too be, become an overcomer and, and more than a conqueror through you, Christ Jesus, my Lord. And I thank you for every leaf in springtime bears witness of your resurrection power. And may that same power that raised you up, Jesus, from the dead, raise me up and raise us up. And I pray this in your precious and holy name. Amen. Friends, we're going to end the service with a ministry moment as we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through the words of the song, My Redeemer Lives. Who taught the sun where to stand in the morning? And who told the ocean you can know this far and who showed the moon where to hide till